who are you and that whoever you are mm -hmm. know that you can be a gift mm -hmm. through who you are you've made this day a special day mm -hmm. and you know how by just your being you there's only one person in the whole world like you and that's you yourself mm -hmm. and people can like you exactly as you are be intentional with your relationships don't fall into the you know we should get together sometime all right yeah i'll call you oh yeah we'll do that make it a priority right make the relationship a priority be intentional have intention and actually do it correct not like oh yeah we'll we'll get together just like no we are getting together at 10 a.m and we see anxiety and loneliness and depression and suicide rates climbing Grubhub, right. Instacart, DoorDash, self-checkout. Don't even have to like look somebody in the eye and hand your credit card over right. to get your groceries. Self-checkout. I can transact by myself. myself. Everything is so by weird. yourself. Right. And he gave me two words. He said, I will answer your question. He said, I'm broken. We're always put out the door instead of being present. Right. Because then people start to accept themselves for who they are. Tom, hello. Hi. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Good to see you. I'm good. So who are you? <laughs> um, all right, my name's Tom, and uh, if this is not a trick question, my, my answer should be that I'm a beloved child of God and everything else flows from that, but if you really want to know like what I do, um, I am a musician and a father and a husband. Um, I work in a couple different places uh, in Syracuse, New York. And I think, the, I think the biggest thing that I do lately is connect with people, try to help them be all of who they are and be okay with that. Um, that seems to be my new calling. Um, yeah, I love Disney and uh, Fred Rogers. I'm sure he'll come up at some point. So. Disney, Mr. Rogers. And what was that thing you said about making people exactly who they are? Is that what you said? Helping people be okay with all of who they are. Being somebody to listen mm -hmm. to people. I think a lot of people, well, I don't know, I think a lot of people listen, but I think often we listen to respond rather than listen to understand. What does that mean? That's different. That so often we have a conversation, if you're talking, I'm immediately thinking, I've got to respond to you, I've got to, I got to ask this question, I got to say, oh, what did you think about this? Instead of just listening. And letting you finish and asking myself what are you really asking me if any are you asking me to respond or did you just want to tell me did you just want to tell me or are you asking me to respond what do you think people want more just to be listened to or for you to actually tell them something I think they just want to be listened to mm -hmm. I hear that over and over again with people at the, sometimes at the end of our time together they'll say wow I didn't know I needed this and that tells me that there are a lot of people out there not listening to people. Wow, I didn't know I needed this. What is this exactly? What do you do with people? It's what to me looks like what what used to be a conversation between <laughs> friends. Back in the day um, when yep. people actually listen to each other. I, I find this in the younger age group, the, the college age students, high school students that and I've heard faculty members say this too, that, that the young people today don't know how to do this. What this you and I are doing right now. They don't know how to do it. Yeah. Um, this I mean, sitting in a room and just talking. Yes, and not... Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, no, so what me and Tom are doing right now, just sitting there talking, not on our devices, not playing a video game, not engaged in even any activity, just literally just sitting there and talking, yep. which is what me and Tom do. Yep. We occasionally would eat, and we occasionally we drink, but those are um, God. What was that Matt Damon movie? He was with Robin Williams. Goodwill Hunting. Goodwill Hunting. When he asked that girl out, and she's like, "Oh, we can get a drink," and he's like, "Well, we can just eat a bunch of caramels because they'd be just as arbitrary." So that's how I feel about like actually getting together with a friend and just talking, like the coffee, the food. It's just kind of a prop. It's just something to do. Yeah. But honestly, you could just kind of sit in your own house with a friend and have the same experience. I, I guess we've been friends for a while. Yep. So maybe you can speak better to what, what do I do? Like, what does Tom do? Yeah. Like what? <laughs> okay. It all begins 
two years ago, three years ago at this point. Uh, so Tom, for as long as I've known him, has been involved in campus ministry. So he, he does a lot of the administrative side and whatnot, but somehow he just created this position for himself where people from all over campus started with students and then it went into faculty and it just kind of, it turned into everybody, comes and they talk to him and they literally just talk to him. He literally just listens for hours sometimes, many hours sometimes. And then they go away or they come away from the interaction thinking like, wow, I didn't know I needed that. And then they come back. And then what the result of that is, is that people start to accept themselves for who they are, which is Tom's gift to the world. Which is like we just said, is like, it's a conversation or it's things that people used to do, like your parents would do it, your friends would do it, your clergy, uh, people in the community, somebody would be there to listen to you, and we don't have that anymore. And Tom does that. Somehow he, I wouldn't say he gets paid for it, it was just kind of a part of like what he did on campus, but he just does it like in his personal life too now. It, it's made me curious, I, I, I'll tell this story. So in 2019, yeah. I was looking out my window, and I noticed students going to class alone. And when my wife and I were in school, we were like the Charlie Brown gang. And we would meet <laughs> in a clump, right? We would go to class and we would meet for dinner. Yeah. We were the first class to be given an email address. And the internet was barely a thing. It was the worst dial-up possible. So you want to make noise? Yeah. So nobody used it. Um, and we didn't have cable TV in Potsdam, so we had to get to know each other. And so as I looked out my window one day, I noticed students going to class alone. And I remember thinking, this is not my problem. And I don't know why I saw it that day, but I did. And then I couldn't not see it. So for three weeks, I just couldn't not see it. And I remember thinking, if some of the manholes were open on the side, <laughs> we would lose half the student body. Because they're just all in their phone. Yes, or they're just walking through life not engaged right um, and so I started to ask students like this is what I see can you tell me about this mm -hmm. and one student said to me um, he was the student government president at the time and he said you're not wrong mm -hmm. I understand what you're saying but I don't know what you do about it so you're not wrong about what about what I see and what you see is students walking by themselves and yeah. just disengage. Yeah. What I perceived as a loneliness problem. That's what loneliness I thought it problem. was. Like that's what I thought. Of. And so I had I had one student um, come in, and uh, this was I remember the date. In fact, the anniversary is coming up. It was October fourth, twenty nineteen. And the reason I remember the date is because of what happened at that meeting. And I just said, okay. His name was Jake. I didn't really know him, but I said, you're a cybersecurity sophomore. Oh, that's it. ROTC. Yeah. Right? I said, but who are you? He was like, I said, who are you? And he, he reached out and he shook my hand, which floored me. I mean, I asked a lot of questions all day long. Nobody's ever stopped and shaken my hand. Just in the middle of the interaction. Yeah, he just stopped yeah. and shook me. Yeah. So it wasn't like, oh, hi, I'm Jake. Correct. It was like you guys were already talking, and then you asked, well, who are you? Yeah, that like just triggered something in him, and he was like, "Wow!" So he should that that was pivotal. It impacted him. Yeah, it impacted him. You know, and he yeah. said a lot. Of, he said nobody has asked me that question in the year and a half that I've been here. Wow. And he said, and I was beginning to think it didn't matter who he is, who he is as a person. Yeah. Who Jake is as a person. But just, and I didn't mean anything by the question. I had no idea what I was asking at that time. Mm -hmm. I just, I just closed the door. I was like, "Okay, I know you do this and this, but who are you?" Who are you? Right. Yeah. How do you answer that? And he gave me two words. He said, I will answer your question. He said, I'm broken. Whoa. Just without even knowing him, he just went right out and said that. Yep. And I remember thinking, what, what do I see that he can't? Because you see him as this like squared away, put together, ROTC, straight A student, very difficult major. Yep. Like, you know, clean cut, just Do like very put together. He's like, I'm broken. Doing doing the, the Air Force thing, getting up at yeah. 5 a.m. to go to SU. to Every day. Every day. Every day. Right? He was, in that day that we met, he was in his um, his camouflage fatigues. Was you uniform, know that? Yeah. And it just floored me. And to me, it was an invitation. For a conversation, and I'll tell you, I don't remember anything we talked about in that meeting. Really? But I remember leaving that thinking, I have a lot more questions for him. Yeah. 
So we met the next week and the next week and the next week. So we met every every week for two years. Wow. There's that book Tuesdays with Maury that I love. Tuesdays I always with Maury. I had Thursdays with Jake. Every every <laughs> Thursday at like four o'clock, two o'clock, uh-huh. we would meet with no agenda, mm-hmm. with no outcome, mm-hmm. just a chance to just to, paint. to process whatever the you know. Can we can we just repeat the fact that you just said no agenda? No agenda. No agenda. Okay, so it seems like just kind of a little like throwaway line, like, oh yeah, no agenda, but I just wanna, I wanna emphasize how important that concept is. When you get together with someone, it's like, oh, it's for dinner. Okay, and now the food's gone, and now our meeting is over. Or it's like, oh, it's to play this game, or it's, oh, it's to do this thing. And then that thing becomes the thing that you're meeting about, and then once it's over, like, it doesn't matter. Your connection is, it doesn't matter. What Tom just said is he just met with this kid every week for years with no agenda except to just be in the same room and just to talk and connect. And what they both got out of that whole interaction was, I I can't even put it into words how important it was to both of them. You know, It wasn't about anything that they wrote together or did together or built or whatever. It was was just like a connection that was formed. And they both understood each other and themselves a thousand times better from having those interactions with no agenda. It starts with no agenda. It accomplishes more than you could possibly imagine, but it starts with no agenda. Okay. But one of the yeah. things that I've learned from, from doing this mm-hmm. is that, I, I tell this to students all the time, they said, our, our interactions with one another today in this society mm-hmm. have become transactional. Yes. Not yes. relational. Transactional, not relational. And transactions are not investments. Yes. They're transactions. Yeah, there's and no future. No. And we see it over and over again. Or we, we remove the human so we don't even have to transact, oh. except with ourselves. Grubhub, right. Instacart, DoorDash, self-checkout. Self-checkout. Don't even have to like look somebody in the eye and hand your credit card over right. to get your groceries. Self-checkout. I can okay. transact by myself. myself. Everything is, is so by weird. yourself. Right. Yeah. And, and we see anxiety and loneliness and depression and suicide rates climbing. Yeah. Right? It used to be that if I didn't want to cook, mm-hmm. we would go out to dinner. Now that's too much work for us. I mean, it cracks me up. Like we call these restaurants, and they can just throw the food at our front door. Yeah, for you to just eat by yourself while you're. Would you call it interacting? Would you call watching TV and movies interacting, or would you call it watching other people interact? Uh, yeah, well, yeah. Because you're interacting with the screen. It's a one-way interaction. And, and I, yeah. I don't think that the smartphone or the, the technology we have is bad. I think it's what it has prevented us from doing. Mm-hmm. You know, when I was a seven, eight-year-old kid, I had a dirt bike. It was a, it was a yellow and blue puppy dirt, dirt bike. bike. And uh, and so I saw a movie van in the neighborhood, and I would go to the house and ring the doorbell and say, hi, I'm Tom, do you want to come out and play? You have kids. We don't do that anymore. No, no. And, well, if a kid does that, it's like, where's your mom? Right. If an adult does that, it's like, why aren't you in jail? So Right. So <laughs> as I juxtaposed what I was seeing on campus, thinking, how come, and students were coming to me a lot around the same time saying we want to start a student club I said for what and they said to learn how to talk to one another who said that was that Jake no Victoria Victoria oh Tori Tori? yeah yeah Yeah, I know Tori Tori came to you and did that yeah and so we had a meeting with like 20 students Mm -hmm. and her and she said we want to learn how to communicate and talk to one another but we don't have the language is that her idea so what what flowed from those conversations was the creation of Fins Unplugged which was a group to just come together off right. the phone and have intentional conversation. Fins unplugged. So you put the phones away and you're just in a group of people. Yes. And Fins means dolphin. So this is all at Lemoyne College up in uh, upstate New York in Syracuse, New York. So it's like dolphins is the logo, the mascot, whatever. So they're Fins, right? Yep. So everything is Fins, just in case people didn't know. Yep. Yeah, Fins unplugged. So that was happening along the same time. And mm-hmm. so I, as I'm having these meetings, I'm from my meetings with Jake eventually flowed the creation of Point of Companions, a men's group, mm-hmm. uh, and then Soul Sisters was a women's group that started. A chance for, for people to come together, right, and look at three questions. Where was the good in your week? Where was the bad in your week? And where was God in your week? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because this was a... Campus was a, Ministry. Yeah, it was a, through the Campus Ministry, it was a Christian-based organization. Um, yeah, can you just repeat that? What was the good in your week? Where was the good in your week? Mm-hmm. Where was the bad in your week? And where was God in your week? And what was fascinating, mm-hmm. right, the success of that group is not what happens in that hour, but what started to happen outside of it. Mm-hmm. 
as they started to invest in one another and didn't wait till the next week for follow-up but would see each other on campus or it was somebody's birthday and they would send a, a text message and say hey it's you know it's Patrick's birthday let's get him a cookie cake because oh, this yeah. was during COVID right we'll, we'll meet outside mm -hmm. and, right that they invested in one another and it wasn't just, you know at the beginning it was where was the good everything was that day oh the worst thing happened today but over time they started to really pay attention to their week and sometimes the good in their week may have been something that happened right after the last meeting and they would be they would hold that oh for the whole week and until they could share it yes yeah and it was never yeah. self-help it wasn't oh you think that's bad i got one no it was a place to just listen mm -hmm. and support them yeah and that was that was amazing um and so then you know as time went on uh two years happened and it went by and it was the end of uh, jake's junior year and we were having breakfast because uh, we had to meet outside during COVID right before he went home for the summer and I said I'll pick up food his phone was off which is not unusual for him um, <laughs> That's true. so he's got a flip phone he's like the only 19 year old with a flip phone I didn't know what he wanted Jake's old school man he's, he's an old soul so I uh, I remembered though from one of our conversations he had talked about liking going to diners with his dad and his brother and his uncle that's where it began and I thought I remember him saying something about liking eggs over easy. <laughs> so I got eggs over easy, and I brought him up. And, and when he opened it, when we sat outside that day, he said, "Wow, you really know me. You know that I like eggs over easy." And to, I said that one time. <laughs> one time, and it, to yeah. me, that was so funny to go from "Who are you?" Mm -hmm. to "Wow, you really know me." Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking in that moment, "It's because you let me, mm. and you didn't have to." Mm -hmm. So, and four weeks later, um, I found myself in the, in the hospital being diagnosed with what I thought was going to be a slip disc. It was stage four kidney cancer. Yeah. Plot twist. It's <laughs> and like, because so, I think you said you found it after a chiropractor, right? Yes. It was a chiropractic adjustment that went kind of bad, or he thought it did, and uh, like he had terrible low back pain. And he was like, oh, what did this chiropractor do to me? So he gets to the hospital, they image him, and that's what they find. And I had a compression fracture in my spine. Now, I, the chiropractor is not at fault. No, no, not that, at all. That, that disc was so eaten by tumor, I think when he adjusted me, that was what yeah. cracked it. That's what found it. Thank God yeah. that I, I went when I did, because they yeah. were going to send me home in the ER with just some muscle relaxers, and I said, no, I can't, I could not get out of bed. Yeah. I'm like, I want whatever you need to find out to, right? Well, in medicine, we call it poop. Pain out of proportion. Okay. Which, all if right. you're paying attention, it, it matters. Uh, because like a slip disc, you know, you have people complaining all the time, like, yeah, hey, it's going down my leg, um, I just kind of woke up with it, or I lifted this and boom, it happened. Yeah. And like, it's terrible pain, but it's not like, people can move, they can bear weight, it's just like, uh, this really hurts, like, they can barely move, but they can move. This was like, no, I can't move a muscle. I literally this could not get out of bed. This is poop. Yeah. This is pain out of proportion, which should then trigger the provider to be like, okay, something might be going on. This guy's probably just dramatic about his back pain, X, Y, and Z, like everybody else, fine. But maybe. Yep. Do a simple x-ray. And then it's like, whoa. What the heck is that? Yep. So, I, as I'm laying there grappling with all this, not knowing what I was telling people, we didn't have a plan, you know, it was all spinning in my head, but I thought, who who needs to hear this from me? And not through the rumor mill, or on Facebook, or whatever. Yeah. So family members, friends, um, students. I, I tell students, right, there's a quote from Fred Rogers that I love, that anything human is mentionable. And anything that. mentionable can be manageable if you talk about it with people that you trust. So here I've done the last two years telling all kinds of students and people in my life, like, whatever you want to talk about, we can talk about. Yeah. To withhold that from them, I thought would be in disservice to them. So I, I called Jake and told him, and a couple weeks later he messaged me and said, could we do a, a, a FaceTime? I said, sure. And I was upstairs, and he wasn't there. Which is weird, because he's never late. But I was like, well, I'm not going anywhere. I couldn't walk. And I was just sitting there waiting. <laughs> May as well wait. <laughs> and then my wife came upstairs and she said, somebody's at the door for me. Oh. So I don't, I don't know who it is. Okay. So I come downstairs, and it was Jake. 
And my, at first, my head is spinning with the details, like, why are you here? How did you get here? I started to say, I can't believe you did this. And then I said, no, actually, I can. Um, but I, I asked him, I said, please tell me you're not driving back tonight. Driving back to where? To New Jersey. So he didn't drive off the two miles from campus. He drove off the four hours from New Jersey. Correct. Wow. And in that moment, I had to grapple with the fact that I clearly meant something to him, and I knew who he had become to me when I realized, yeah, this this person drove three and a half hours from New Jersey yeah. to see me for 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. Now, if you had told me, that in 2019, on October 4th, <laughs> because I asked the kid, who are you? Right. All of this would Well, and again, with no agenda. Correct. He didn't come up to do anything or to go to a show with him or to like do anything specific. He came up to see you. Correct. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Um, because that's important. And I, I think we, we live our life looking through the windshield. I shared this with some high school mm-hmm. students yesterday. But we only make sense of it when we look in the rearview mirror. You know, we are so fast-paced in this. We're just constantly going. I've never seen a society more interested in where they have to be next. Right? It's like me, like, well, okay, I'm here now. Like, I, like this morning, I'm really looking forward to seeing boys, but you know, I have this next thing. When do I have to go? So we always have the next thing. We're always foot out the door instead of being present. Right. But it's only when we stop that train and look in the rearview mirror that we start to see the patterns over and over and over again. And so through my meetings with students, I, I thought, oh, I have this ability to work with people that are 18 to 22 and draw the best out of themselves. And then I started to notice the patterns where this would happen with my friends. Mm-hmm. Or older. Who are old, right. Or with, with other people. And they would say, like the students, I didn't know I needed this. Yeah. So when I went back to, to my, my my daughters looking at all this, like what has happened from the seven-year-old on a dirt bike mm-hmm. to where we are today? And I realized that when my daughters want to play with someone, mm-hmm. my wife will set up a play date. Right. I never went out to play dates. I went want, out in the neighborhood. You just went. You know, street light comes on, come home. Right. If they ask you to stay for dinner, uh, you can, but you have to call us and ask us. You know, there, there were rules. Yeah. There was no play date. My parents didn't come with me. Right. But what we've had to do to keep our children safe these days, that has kind of taken away some of those skills that I learned to develop because I didn't have a smartphone. I had a massive blowout on my dirt bike one year, flipped over the handlebars, rolled down the hill, had to get seven stitches in my chin. Oh, jeez. There were neighbors, yeah. playmates that saw what was happening, ran to get help. Yeah. You know? Um, I get nervous now when my daughter goes out for a bike ride in the neighborhood the block. for 15 minutes. Yeah. Because you just don't know. We don't know. Um, and you probably have a cell phone and an air tag on it. I do. Whereas we didn't have that in the past. Right. Yeah. So that really helped me see what the current college students were facing when I thought about my daughters. Because I thought, how will they have the language in three years or five years or eight years right. to walk up to somebody and say, hi, I'm so and so, do you want to be my friend? I've noticed that so much. <laughs> So especially like lately, the weather's been really nice, and I walk my neighbor's dog, Holly, because she's the sweetest dog ever, and so, and you know, she loves me, so I just like walk around uh, the block with her, and I've started walking around campus with her, because Syracuse University campus is just beautiful if you ever take a walk. Very historic, it's from like 1820 or something. Mm-hmm. Lots of old buildings, lots of beautiful architecture, lots of cool like historical plaques and stuff. So it's just a nice place to walk, it's like a park. Yep. And so I've been walking this dog around campus, and sure enough, there's a bunch of kids in backpacks, you know, going to class, going to and from class. They all look at the dog, because it's a cute dog, yep. and then they just like, keep going. And like, you literally have to be like, do you want to pet this dog? And then they like, very meekly go like, yeah, yeah, I do. And it's like, but whereas me, I go to a park and I see a dog, I'm already petting it before the owner even knows I'm there. And it's just like, which is probably isn't the best thing to do sometimes if it's like a therapy dog. No, dude. The point is, these kids like, don't have, any social skills, it seems like. Like they're uncomfortable with strangers, maybe not a bad thing. They're uncomfortable with people like just trying to talk to them. Yep. They don't really know what to do. Right. And it's from that. It's just like from being super sheltered, from not going out and 
having what? to like interact with the world as children. Yep. You know, because they're just so sheltered. Playdates are set up. There's nothing. There's no. There's no social skills. Right. It seems like. And we're suspect now. Yeah, that's, that's that too. Thing. Like sitting. That too. You know, when when I talk with with students or with people, they're they're waiting. I'm, I'm they're waiting for the ask. Like, well, you brought me in here because you must want me to do something. Right. You, know, you want me to read? You want me to give a talk? To me? Right. Like, I just want to get to know you as a no. human being. Right. Who are you? Who are? Because who, who makes, are you? Because right, it makes a difference. <laughs> yes. Should you ever need someday a letter of recommendation, a reference? Mm -hmm. Right. You will hear in my voice if, oh, you want to hire Boris? I can tell you all about him. Right. Rather than, I don't really know him. He took a class. Yeah, he did this. He did that. Yeah. How many different ways can I say they're, you know, organized, efficient? Discipline, like, but if I right. really know them, I can share stories. You can tell them that I'm none of those things. <laughs> and and I think the the three things that that, that I've noticed that have helped me. Uh, there's a quote from somebody, and, and it says, it says, pay attention, be astonished, tell about. Pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. So pay attention to, to your day, to your life, mm -hmm. right? Be astonished mm -hmm. at whatever happened, yeah. and tell somebody about it. Mm -hmm. That that's the first thing, right? To tell some, and then to be intentional with your relationships, and to judge, to just to be intentional to what does that mean? to. Don't fall into the, you know, we should get together sometime. All right, yeah, I'll call you. Oh. Yeah, we'll do that. Make it a priority. Right. Make the relationship a priority, be intentional. Right. Like, just like you're working on your degree or your project or your work or your fitness routine or your hobbies, whatever it is that you're doing that you're planning and, like, you put effort into, your relationships deserve that or even more. Right. Be intentional as in, like, have intention and actually do it. Correct. Not like, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll get together. Just like, no, we are getting together at 10 a.m. And then Tom texts me, and then now it's 11. <laughs> and then now it's 11 15, but I will be there. <laughs> yep. Matthew Kelly, that that, today. an author that I really like, he says the, the most important things in life are seldom urgent. The most important things in life are seldom urgent. Right. How so? We, I have a whole list of things to do today that all seem really pressing. Right? Go to the store, make an appointment to get my car inspected. Like This is really important stuff. None of that matters. I had a, a friend of mine last night. I had just gotten home, and they blew out two tires on their car. Oh, wow. And they called me. They were out on Erie Boulevard. I mean, I had literally just gotten home from Erie Boulevard. Yep. And they said, the tow truck will be here in an hour. And I said, do you want me to come out? And they said, I would never ask you to do that. I said, Why? so I went. Yeah. Right? That was actually an important thing. Mm -hmm. Not the stuff that I wanted to get done when I got home. Right. That when I was driving home feel, felt like this is really important. This needs to happen. I've got to pay this bill. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. You know? So to, to be intentional when you're when you're with somebody, because life gets crazy, right? Mm -hmm. Set up the next meeting. Mm -hmm. The next the next time you're gonna get together. And it's not making an appointment. Like I don't need to make an appointment with people. Kind of. But but it shows that it's important enough that I want to walk the time. Right. And actually commit to it and actually do it. Correct. It's not like, oh, well, if everything else falls through, then we'll get together. Or, I don't know, something else comes up or I get to pick up a shift. I'm like, no, like, I have plans. Right. With Tom. Yep. That's important. Be That's in, what he means by being intentional. Be intentional. And, then, and the last one yeah. is just show up. Which I think, it, how many of us have, have relationships where we have a bad day at work, where we have, I, I was supposed to hang outside, but I, I'm, I'm no good tonight. Yeah, I'm not in the right mental space, or my anxiety's bad, or I'm feeling depressed, so I'm just not, I'm not going to be my best self that I'm like portraying on Instagram, so therefore, I'm not getting together with you. Right. But no, what you really need is to get together with someone you love and trust, Yep. and that will make you your best self. Because I right? know that, yes, because I know that going, or somebody else coming, like you're not gonna leave in the same space because mm -hmm. whoever like they're gonna move yeah. forward. Yes. And I think that that is important. We need to we need to remember that. When we wanna cancel plans with people because we're not our best selves, that's probably the time when we should not cancel. That's when you need those plans the most. Right. That's when you need to interact and be listened to and to listen the most. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because when you're not in the best self. Right. Yeah, it just it fills your cup. I remember this. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, and to not have an agenda. Yeah. Right. Like, that's the other like. It's not well. I got to get divorced because this thing happened in my life, or I got to give an update about this. It's. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's that way. Like, oh man, I really. Like I, I've texted Tom so many times, and like something's going wrong, or something I just need to like talk through, and I go, I need a Tom talk. Tom, Tom talks, <laughs> you know, because that's that. I don't know. That's what I've been calling them. That's what they're in my phone as. Like Tom, I need a Tom talk. He's like, oh, what's wrong? And then I tell him, and he's like, oh yeah, we'll get together. Um, and like sometimes we'll talk about that for a minute. Sometimes we'll talk about it for five minutes, but like we always end up talking about way other things, way more. Mm -hmm. It's just like, yeah, we'll get through that. Sure, no big deal at all. But that's, it's not a psychiatry session. You're not just like stewing on it. It's just like, no, I just need to tell you. Or maybe I really need your advice. And then, boom, that's it. And then we talk about other stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I think it, it's, it's intentional relationship, deep friendship, which is so interesting because through these conversations with people, I come to, in some ways, I mean, I'm looking at this heart here on the table, know their heart. Heart. There's a heart here, yeah. Because they let me, oh, like the heart work. Heart. But what we yeah. often base how well we know people on, like I could say, you know, of course, like, we're really good friends. Yeah. And my wife could say, well, you have your cup, well, what does he like to eat? I'm like, I don't know. Everything. What's his favorite color? Or what's, does he like candy? Or whatever. I'm like, but, she, but and she's like, well, you don't know? And I'm like, no. So you said you're really good friends. I'm like, yeah, we are, but Who cares about it's, the, it's the core of the onion. It's not the superficial stuff. Mm -hmm. But most friendships start there. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully somebody will trust enough to deepen it a little bit and deepen it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I find that with many relationships, now I actually have to like kind of zoom out mm -hmm. and learn some of the trivial stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, because so, you oh, didn't like, that's interesting. you know I love donuts. Well, that... I hate donuts. I know you do. <laughs> That didn't bring us together, like our love of donuts, right? No, because I hate donuts. But over time, you're like, I hate them as a concept. I, I enjoy eating them. I hate the fact that they exist. Right. We'll get into that. Yeah. So it, it's just interesting how society marks what a good friendship is, right? Versus how I have come to understand. That's such an interesting concept because, like Tom just said, like most people start with the trivial stuff. And almost everyone just stays there. Mm -hmm. Like almost everyone knows, like, oh well, my friend Bob's favorite color is green, and he drives a Camry. And one day he wants a green Camry, and now we are best friends. But he has no idea that Bob was crying last night because X, Y, and Z. Whereas Tom, when he meets you, he doesn't ask what your favorite color is. It's who are you? And then you tell him for forty-five minutes, and he still doesn't know what your favorite color is. Mm -hmm. Right. The point is, relationships are so superficial because that's comfortable. It's not vulnerable. It's it's just easy, but it's yeah, there's no depth of that. You don't get anything out of telling you your favorite color. Correct. Like okay, if Tom and I sat in a room for forty minutes and we talked about nothing but like that wall is gray, well, that wall is blue. My favorite color is green. I like cars. Do you like cars? I like donuts. Well, I hate donuts. Like right. and just like talked about facts and just talked about subjective crap and just talked about like what do you do for a living how is your 401k which is literally everybody instead we talk about i don't even know what the heck we talk about we just talk about who we are right what things mean to us and what people in our lives are doing and what that means about us and being yeah. able to, to know, have the hard conversations around things that right. for some reason people don't have the courage to say mm. you know i mean you and have conversations and i'm like what do you mean the hard conversations? Like things about the things that are difficult to yeah, talk about? Yes, or character attributes. Like mm -hmm. if you said to me, Tom, do you know sometimes you can be incredibly stubborn? Okay. Like, oh, let's talk about that. Tell me like what the, or, or you have the courage to say, no, I think you're being, I think you're being too critical here. Mm. I told like, you that. Yeah, like, yeah, let's look at that. Whereas a lot of people would be like, no, screw you. Like, I, I couldn't tell How dare you tell me that? Right. Yeah. And I think the other thing, too, is that people were uncomfortable, and it took me a long time to, to learn for myself, but we're uncomfortable sharing our heart. Right? If I could, I could text Boris or call him and play this off like, uh, hey, man, like, haven't seen you in a while, let's catch up. Yeah. Or 
I could say, uh, you know, Boris, it's been way too long. I haven't seen you in a while, and I miss you. Who, yeah, especially guys, especially men, who says I miss you? Right. To a friend. So which so one reveals? That, which one reveals my heart more? Mm -hmm. Because it'd be very easy for you to just like, nah, I don't have time this week, and be like, I'm okay. Yeah, which one am I going to answer? But I might More be, yeah, yeah, might be kind of hurt by that. Mm -hmm. But it's because I didn't ask for what I needed mm -hmm. or wanted. Right. The second message did tell you that, mm -hmm. and I, I think people should also leave open. I see this with the college students sometimes. Like, well, why don't you ask them if they want to go to dinner? Like, do you want to go to dinner tonight? Somebody right back, no. I'm like, okay. And they're like, well, they hate me, right? I'm like, no, right. I would love to get together. Could we grab dinner sometime this week? Right. Tell me what works for you. Yeah. Right. That's it. Right. So they may they may have literally answered, no, I can't have dinner tonight. Well, they don't mean ever. Right. They don't mean there's something wrong with you. I don't want to eat with you ever. You're a terrible person. How dare you text me? They're just like, no, I have dinner plans. Right. Or no, I'm not hungry. Or no, I don't know, I'm sick. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I remember, this is kind of a funny story. I remember one time... Uh, it was a Monday, and I and Jake was having a tough time. I remember this. Mm -hmm. And Monday was my day off, so I, <laughs> and I like I have time today for, for right. which is unusual. I have time in my schedule. I thought maybe I could make a difference, and so I I texted him and I said because I know getting away from the situation can be helpful for people. Very true. I'm like, why don't we meet at Gannon's later? Yeah. Just oh, ice, ice cream. cream. Yeah. We'll just talk, right? Mm -hmm. And he wrote back and he said, I have work. I don't need ice cream. Okay. And I remember thinking. What? What kind of an answer is that? What do you mean? Just like, because well, I was taking it. Literally, like he literally oh. had work and he didn't need ice cream. Sure. So when we met that Thursday, before as we before we started really like talking, I said, I got to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. I said, because now I've known you for two and a half years. I'm like, you know it wasn't about the ice cream, right? Oh, I see why you were taken aback by that. Okay. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, Monday. Yeah. He said, oh no. He's like, what? Did I... Did you try to help him? I gave you some like snarky answer. Like, yeah, because oh. he was just in a bad space, but he was pre he had to get this work done, uh -huh. and and missed the fact that Tom was just trying to help, mm. right? But I, I'm like, I don't need ice cream. Like, it's not about the ice cream, right? Right. But we, mm. but if we don't have the courage to to talk about. That, then we just dance around it, and you're you're at the next interaction, just resenting. Mm -hmm. How could you treat me like that? Like I was trying to help you, but we never voice it, and you never talk about it. Right. And that like that eats away at you. It's like oh, remember that time two years ago? Like you probably don't remember, but like it's it's ingrained in there if you never actually talk about it. Right. You know, just one little barb after the next. And That's I, interesting. I shared this other little tidbit with students yesterday. I said sometimes people will say to me. Wow, like you talk about this person a lot. What did they do for you? And that, that goes back to the transactional thing. And I will often say to people, they didn't do anything. They were. They existed. Or they are. Or they are, they were, they didn't do. Right. Because people wanted to be like, oh, well, of course. Like, you know, Boris gave you his kidney. Of course you're friends. But no, but right? Like, like. There has to be some kind of, or they helped you close on your house. So, oh, of course, that's how they know each other. Yeah, like, he has this skill set, or, like, he did this for me, or he gave me money. Like, now we're friends. Right. It's like, no, like, we just, we existed, and we connected, and we, uh, so I'm just going to wait for the door to close there. Yeah, like, we existed, we connected, we listened. Yep. That's what we did. You know? We had a conversation. Yes, we had many conversations. Yep. Nothing was actually, I mean, I'm sure we've done stuff for each other, bought dinner back and forth. Yep. Hundreds oh. of times at this point, who knows who? Hey, who paid last? last? Who? who paid last? I don't. I don't know. I can't. Who cares? Does it matter? I can't stand. I know that people have budget concerns, and that's a reality. But I cannot stand this Venmo culture. That if that if Venmo and, culture. That if you and I are friends enough to, to go on a road trip together, right? Right, and you're getting gas, and I'm going to run in and say I'm going to grab a bag of chips. Do you want anything? And you're like, yeah, grab me a Diet Coke. And I get it. And you're like, you can buy me the two bucks. Right. What it's are two we bucks, doing? Buddy. Come on, just, just let it go. I used to work in an ice cream yeah. store. And the, there yeah, was... No, uh, no Peter's, Peter's Polar Parlor. <gasps> Peter's Polar Parlor. 
Pete's Polar Parlor Pete's Polar in Camillus. Parlor. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there were these They're two good. women that would come every day, uh -huh. and they would get two small cones, two small sugar cones. Are these, these like old ladies? Yes. Did they pull up in like a classic Cadillac too, <laughs> with their hair all done up and like? <laughs> Damn. And back then, the small cone was ninety-five cents. Now it's like nine ninety-nine. And they would, they would always say, "They're like, we want two small twists, wow. and we're paying separately, and we want the nickel back." Whoa. And I remember thinking, I called, being married to them. I called my friend Scott, and I said, Scott, I said, when the, he's my college roommate, I said, yeah. when the day comes that I can't buy you a 95 cent ice cream, uh -huh. we need to re examine this whole friendship. <laughs> you know? Like, don't let me get like that. We're paying, some, so two old ladies pull up to it, sounds like a joke, because it is, but it's real. Two old ladies pull up to an ice cream parlor, and they say, we want two twists, 95 cents each, we're paying separately, and we want the nickel back. Nickelback was a terrible band. <laughs> oh, it's probably based on this story. Do you think that's what it's based on? I don't know. Nickelback? I, like somebody getting a Nickelback from the dollar? It, uh, terrible band for a terrible situation. Just floored me. And we want the nickel back. Yep. Oof. Yep. So that, that whole, yeah, just that transaction. Well, can, I, can we revisit that? Because they were coming every single week or every single day. Yeah, a couple, a couple times, times a week. week they would come. A couple times a week. Yeah. But still, a couple times a week, every single week, they're consistently seeing each other and doing this. Right. Right. What were they talking about? Well, they were like eating their 95 cent ice cream. <laughs> I don't know why they come. Were they sitting there talking? I don't know. I didn't pay that close attention. So I was not the next customer. Because I don't know. I mean, like, it's something consistent in both of their lives. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, they, I'm sure they connect. Sure. In some way. Maybe not very, very closely, or maybe super closely, or, or as closely as they're comfortable with. But, like, they're, they can count on each other. Correct. Let's say it's Deb and Barb. Deb can count on seeing Barb twice a week, every single week for the rest of her life for her 95 cent cone. Yep. Yep. And that's valuable. Yep. The fact that they can't buy each other a cone, I don't know. Maybe that was like from a depression era. Sure. Yeah, everything sure. was like penny pinchy, um, no abundance financially. Yep. But the fact of the matter is they're still getting together. Correct. But we want the nickel back. They want the nickel. And Deb, you're, I'm not buying you a cone. And Barb, you can screw yourself. I'm not buying you a cone. But I, I tell that story because I think it's interesting that, and I see this when people go out and they fight over the check. I do this with my dad all the time. I'm yeah. Like, Come on, we're still going to do that? Come on, I got you. But friends will take the things that are hardest to give mm -hmm. without thinking about it. Like our time, mm -hmm. right? Our, the time that I'm going to spend worrying about you because you shared with me a problem and I'm going right. to think about how to, how to help that or how to... Hold it. Um, so the emotional anguish, our time, our energy, our love. But when it comes to our money, which is sometimes the easiest thing to give, that's where people put up the fight. Right. right. No, no, no. You're not paying for that. I'll, I'll get it. I'm like some people put up the fight, and some people just take and take and take and take and take and take and take. Right. Right. It depends on the person. Yep. But yeah. Yep. So I yeah I think. You know, I, who are the people, Matthew Kelly talks about this, who are the people that you do life with? Do life and with. And I love that question. Mm -hmm. You know, where you just, it's like, I, I'll ask people, who are, the, who are the people in your life that you can do nothing with? Yeah. Because that's everything. Mm -hmm. Where you don't have the awkward, like, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? What do you want, right? What do you want on your pizza? Well, I'll eat anything. No pepper, no pepper. Why do we want it to do Just, yeah. right? The people you can do nothing with, is everything because it's not about anything you do I mean you and I have done that right like I don't you and I don't it, it, the world might see like they don't have a lot in common and yet they're friends actually so, yeah I'm so gonna... Boris one day said well do you want to go shooting like, oh yeah that was interesting I've never done that shooting guns right yeah and it wasn't I'm gonna take you shooting and you're gonna love it so much like you're gonna do this thing and you're gonna buy a gun right no but yeah it gave me a glimpse into an aspect of you. Mm -hmm. Something I enjoy. Right. Yeah. And I think we hear the word, well, you're very different. I think sometimes people hear that as negative. Right. I'm like, no, it just means different. Right. It, right? It, it doesn't mean anything other than that. Mm -hmm. But it's also a good thing. It is a good thing. You know, because then you can learn from someone who's different. What are you going to learn from someone who's the same way as you? Right. You know, it's very, very comfortable. You're going to do the same things, and you're going to, okay, whatever, and you don't have to grow in any which way. Yep. But I'm sure, okay, somebody, you've never shot a gun before. No. Before that experience. Never. Did you find that you were any different after that experience? 
Well, or that you thought about it a different way, or I mean, it was a new experience, and it was not an easy one either. No, it wasn't. Yeah. Um, so, like, what did you think? It, it it gave me a lot of respect for people that that have to use firearms mm -hmm. in the moment. Yeah. Um, you know, here I am with this thing in my hand, like it's like. To do and I, it's and scary. What I didn't expect was the pushback from the release. Yeah, it was a nine millimeter. It's like handgun. Okay, got to get used to this. Glock forty eight. So it does have a bit of a recoil. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's interesting sometimes when you're with the right people, mm -hmm. it takes the focus off me mm -hmm. because it's interesting to me how like like I trusted you. Right. And how we will put stock in other people and our trust in them. Like, I've done things with friends that I would never do on my own. Like what? Like, like ride scary amusement park rides. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, it's totally stupid because the ride is not any safer because I'm riding it with you. Well, Tom, why would you want to go on a roller coaster by yourself? It's or, just not a solitary activity. You or my wife or whoever, elevator. it's still the same ride. Right. But, but it's different with the other people. Weird, like, yeah. All right. I'll do. If you're gonna do it, I'll do it. If you're gonna do it, I'll do it. It's weird. Like, yeah. I, it's like the whole my beer culture. Right. You're not gonna save it if this thing loses. True. A right. True. If it comes off the rails, like you being here isn't gonna change anything. Right. But we're doing it together. Correct. Yes. And and that makes a difference. Oh yeah. We're social creatures. Yep. As much as the world wants to, as much as the like self checkout, Instacart. Grubhub world wants to make us just like little islands. We're social creatures. Yep. I, I've been thinking about that a lot lately, actually. Uh, we're not going to get all into like attachment theory, but you know, I got that like little certification. Yep. And there's like, they basically categorize people into like these attachment styles. Everyone's obviously unique, but it's just like some people crave connection so much that they feel like it's like a never ending pit that they just need to connect more and more. And then they, they become kind of controlling and kind of anxious and needy. And then some people go way the opposite side of the spectrum and they push connection away and they feel like they don't need anyone. Yep. But then those are the people that like, they're just never satisfied. They don't have that thing and they think something's wrong with them because they can't connect because they won't allow themselves to. And then there's people who do connect. Correct. And for some reason, life for them is just more rich and yep. fulfilling and just, they don't feel like they're missing something because yep. they can connect. I think in our culture, and especially for men, mm. we see it as a badge of honor to say, I've got this. Mm. And the heavy, be anybody else. Right, the heavier the backpack, the more yeah. noble it is. Right. I don't need your help, I've got this. Mm. Now, if I asked you to carry this couch by yourself halfway across my neighborhood and mm -hmm. give it to a friend, the couch is probably gonna get broken in the process <laughs> and you're gonna come back, you're gonna be a wreck because right. we're too proud to say, I need help. Right. Now, if we did that, that mm. I need help, we ask other people to help us, it's going to get there faster, it's going to be in one piece, and you're all going to be like, great, now what? And now you have a memory, too. And hey, I remember think, when we carried that couch? Yeah. yeah. You know? and it's all I positive. Sometimes we go to the other extreme, mm -hmm. where we we can fall into codependence, yes. which is what you were talking about, which I think is yeah. equally as toxic. Equally as toxic. I just can't function without this person in my life. Like I can't even move. Yeah. But what about interdependence? Thank you. Right? Yes. That, that I am a better husband, father musician person because you're in my life yes that's different yes that that yes I, can, I am independent I can I can do my own thing yeah but man life is a lot better because you're in it I can so I was thinking about that a lot lately too surviving versus thriving mm. you can survive just fine on your own you can live by yourself in a cabin in the woods if you know how to, I don't know, how to garden, how to hunt, whatever, you can survive. Are you going to be satisfied and happy? Absolutely not. You can't thrive on your own. You need other people to thrive. You're social creatures. But you can survive. So people out there, are you surviving or are you thriving? And if you're just surviving, think about what's missing. It's probably something social. It's probably other people. Are you working in an office by yourself, not interacting with anybody, then you go home and you watch TV or YouTube and you watch these conversations, maybe like this one, and you feel like you're interacting, and that's not taking away from podcasts or from like very important influencers and people that can teach you things and like you feel like you're there with them. That's wonderful. But are you interacting? Is somebody hearing you, listening, 
responding or maybe not even responding, but you feel like you're there is a connection. Yep. Do you have that? If not, you're not you're not thriving. You're surviving. Not not only to, only surviving. Yeah. Not to be theological here, but there's get a theological. Quote, there's a quote get theological. Love. Let's go. Um, Saint Irenaeus, who I don't know much about, but he has a quote. It says, "Saint the, Irenaeus, the glory of God is the human person fully alive. The glory of God is the human person." Fully alive, yes. as in thriving, not surviving. Yes, and yes. yes, to me, the most important word in that sense is fully. Fully, because there's a lot of people. That's what I noticed looking out my window. There's a lot of people walking around breathing. Well, everyone's surviving. Who are? Yeah. Living, but they're not thriving. Yeah. Yeah. It, they're not fully alive. They're pseudo alive. Yep. Yeah. And I, I think that that's the whole be intentional piece. I, I often tell people. Because I think one of the ways that we can help people erode the mental health crisis that we have, mm -hmm. and there is one, is to get out of our own way, mm -hmm. to have the courage to tell the person in front of us mm -hmm. who they are to us and for us. Right. Oh, so and not just who they are, to us and for us. Yes. As in, you are my friend. Right. I care about you. Yeah, because yes. I don't... You're my friend. You're my but I don't get to decide right. that I'm yours. You True. do. True. Right? Yes. And so not just to go through, right? Like, people know that my favorite store is Johnson & Murphy. I was just looking at your socks. I was right. like, those are from Johnson & yeah, Murphy. That's your dang shirt. Right. Tom loves the crap out of some I, Johnson & Murphy. I can't. If there's a sale, he will buy seven vests and he'll give me two. I can't, I can't tell and, you the and, number I mean, of too many vests now. That will, when they pass a Johnson Murphy in an airport or in a mall, yeah, every time I text you, they'll snap a picture look. and say, and <laughs> that makes the person feel good. Yeah, like you remembered something about me. Right. But oftentimes yeah. we'll say, well, I, I don't want to, that would be weird. And yet when I, when I ask would that people, be weird? what would that feel like if somebody did that too? They'd be amazing. Yeah. Right? So get out of your own way. Right. And this concept that we are bothering people. Mm -hmm. I noticed my, my friend Scott, 30 years we've been friends. Um, one day I was going to call him, yeah. and I thought, no, I know he's busy. I don't want to bother him. Mm -hmm. Or and I had I had somebody tell me once. They said, I don't want I don't want to be a burden to mm -hmm. you. And I remember I got so angry because if there's two things that just really make me angry, and it's not much. It's when people demean themselves or others. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, mm -hmm. you don't get to decide that. Mm -hmm. I do. You don't get to decide if you're a burden to me. Wait. The word demean, like de-meaning, like taking away your meaning. Yep. Like you don't mean anything. Yep. When people demean themselves, they think that they don't mean anything to themselves or to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And Tom's like, no, you don't get to decide that for me because to me, you do mean something. Correct. You know, even if it doesn't feel like it for you, to me, you mean something and you mean a lot. Yep. So you don't get to demean yourself when someone says like, no, I feel like a burden trying to take some of your time. Yep. And Tom's like, first off, you're not taking. Second... Don't demean yourself because to me you mean a lot. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And that really pisses them off. It makes me so mad. When people do that, when they don't value themselves or think that he doesn't value them. Correct. Yeah. Because he does. Correct. Yeah. Yep. It, yeah, we have to. We just have to help people with that. You with, know, to. to with meaning? To, yes. Mm -hmm. To. Because we, I saw this this homily. We spend all of our life, most of our life, especially in college and grad school and mm -hmm. profession, like building our resume. Yeah. The resume virtues. Mm -hmm. But we spend little time building the eulogy virtues. The eulogy virtues. Right. What Nobody. I. I do a lot of funerals because I work in a church. As a oh, eulogy. Church. That's what a eulogy. I is. never that's hear I, people get yeah. up. Oh man, they were the best bio major. <laughs> or man, that Boris, he got a, he got into PA school. Like I'll tell you that. No, they talk in about my eulogy. If people said that, right? I wasn't even a good bio major. I was he, a terrible bio major. They'll talk about your character, or that know. that you were you were there for them, or you were a listener, or you loved to cook and provide hospitality to people. Mm -hmm. Like that's. That's what I mean, like yeah. that it, because the the relationships that we have mm -hmm. are not usually based on what we do. Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't need, I don't need Jake to fire a nuclear missile for me. He doesn't need me to play the piano most of the time. Right. We're together, like most I don't of the need time. to come see you. Right. 
for some medical reason. Once in a while. But right. Rarely. But that's not the heart of it. Right. That's like, those are ancillary, I guess you can call them benefits. Right. Like, if you have a network of people that you really care about and that really care about you, like any, like they probably have skills and they probably have abilities and they probably have connections and they probably have whatever that they'll be more than happy to share with you, like more excited to share with you than you even want from them. But that's like a side thing. That's just like, yeah, sure, of course. Yep. You know, you're one of my people. But that's not the main thing. The main thing is the connection. Right. And I feel like people get that backwards. Yep. They're like, oh, you have a medical license. Maybe I should be friends with you in case I need an antibiotic one day. Like, no, I don't want to be friends with you if you're going to be like that. But if we're already friends and we already connect and we already like care about each other, it's like four in the morning, oh, you're feeling sick? I got you, come on, whatever, right. fine. Yep. But that's because the first thing was in place first. You build um, your team. You build your team, you build your tribe, and like just as a side benefit, you know, everybody can do something, yep. you know, but it's all about the connection first. Yes. And I've learned about the power of the comma. One part of the comma? Yeah, when we're, when we're, ta when I'm okay. talking to myself, right, don't call the doctor, right? When we, how often do we say, I can't do this? Uh -huh. I was walked, I was looking at my deck one day and I'm thinking, this thing, it was rotten, and I'm like, I can't, I, don't, I can't, I can't do this. What, build the deck? Yeah. Or, or resurface the deck but or something? Any, yeah. any of like I, I don't know the difference between a Phillips head and a straight head screwdriver. Oh, I know that. Right, like That's where it ends. I can't do this, and I'm thinking, wait a minute. I know somebody who can. Matt, Matt, Matt the contract. Matt the contract. Right, yeah, like, Matt the yeah, contract. Andy, Maddie. Okay. He's in my bathroom. <laughs> I'm like, it's glorious. I'll put a picture up. So I said, I can't do this comma alone. I can't do this comma alone. Alone. So because I can't do this, but I can't do it alone. As soon as you put alone in there, it takes the focus off you and turns you out to others. And I think we love stories like that as humanity, right? The Grinch, the Abominable Snow Monster, the Tom Hanks <laughs> movie that came out, um, A Man Named Otto. Anytime we see these characters that are turned inward, uh -huh. they shrink their world. Right. It becomes like watching Roundup sprayed on a dandelion, and it just does this, right? But as soon as they start to realize it's not about them, life grows from that. That's how the Grinch's heart grew two sizes, right? right? That's or you celebrating cardio megaly. Celebrating differences, right? The elves and people didn't have to be threatened by Rudolph's nose. They could actually <laughs> use that Santa on his team, uh -huh. right? A man named Otto who had a lot of grief. Mr. Fredrickson and Up. Right? Oh yeah, that, that's what his name was—the old man in Up. Yes. Yeah, he was like a total like recluse, and like his wife died, and There's he just like of, hid in his house for grief. decades. Yeah. And then once he opened his door to the little the little kid—I forgot his name—but then like his world just exploded, expanded. Right. And then he got a dog, and that's what really makes your world worthwhile. Getting dog. Dog. And love that dog. Up. So, so to build your team. Yes. For life, your team for life. Yes. Yeah. Because it's not just for a time, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, you don't know where those friendships are going to lead, right? Or, or where they're going to take you. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you just don't. You know, and I, I remember thinking this summer, um, uh, Jake's family went down to the Jersey Shore. Mm -hmm. And I got to go down. He was home on leave. I got to go down and spend a couple days with him. Yeah. And I remember sitting with, it was his whole family and his extended family, mm -hmm. talking to his aunt and looking at how the world looks at things and thinking like, this, yes. me being here, should not happen. Why? And just when you look at it, right, like, I, we want the transaction. I worked here. You helped Jake with a problem at a time in his life. And oh. now he's moved on, right? Why are you still in his life? Right. Yeah. And his aunt said, that's a real testament to you. Mm -hmm. right? There are a lot of people that you can do a lot of things with. Right. But to have a family vacation is a really sacred time. True. To right. invite somebody else on your family vacation. Correct. Right. And so I got to, to, to not just hear all those stories that I had heard or these characters in somebody's life, mm -hmm. but I got to be written into that story. Yeah. In a very intentional way, yes. you know, and I, I did have somebody in my life tell me once, because I asked them, I said, why did you finally open up? And they said, I knew that if I wanted your help, 
I couldn't just let you read my story. I had I had to write you into this. Wait, somebody said this to you? Yes. What did say that one more time? They somebody said, who was this person by the way? This was a somebody that I know at the morning. Oh, so uh, a staff member was just somebody else, another person that didn't know you well. Correct. Said that what? They said I knew that if I really wanted your help, I couldn't let you just read my story. Mm -hmm. I had to write you into it. They had to invite me in mm -hmm. to the mess. Yeah. I was never this, asked for that. Did they say this before they got to know you, or like as this you were was, getting to know you? This was like you? a year in. Okay, and, as And we had both them. noticed there was a lot more trust that yes. had developed, and I, I remember asking about that. I said, our meetings feel very different. Yeah, a year later. A year later. Yeah, right. And we're not just talking about this breakup that you went through. Oh, that's what initially got him to start talking to you. Yep. But then it went way past that. Way past that. Way past that, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's a quote that I have just never forgot. Because there are, I think, it's interesting to, to be invited into people's lives mm -hmm. in that way where I'm not just going to let you read my story, I'm going to give you the red pen. So you're going to write and let you edit it. Let you edit my March, story. March, put notes in the margin for it. Ask those hard questions. Um, have input. Right. Not just outsider, but inside the story. Right. Yeah. In a sitcom, it's like when a character comes on, you hear that sometimes, like, well, they were supposed to only be on for one episode. And then they stayed. But, right. Yeah. But they stayed in your life. Right. Um, and you don't know how. No. You'll, you'll never know how. And some people might come back in and out. Like, people aren't transactions. People are not transactions. You never know when you just might need it. Yep. Or when they might just be in a situation to be in your life again. Yep. You know, like the military taught me this because you move around so much. Mm -hmm. And like in the military, it's understood that, you know, just because you're going to be in a certain place for only two years, it doesn't mean you should not become part of this, the community and make friendships and laugh and cry and have really good close friendships yep. just because you're going to leave or they're going to leave. You do that everywhere you're planted. And maybe at some point you'll be somewhere long term. That's the dream in the military is just to come home uh, sure. for a long time. But it doesn't mean that you should not form relationships everywhere you go. Right. Like some of my best friends, I've known for well over a decade, and I met them in the military. Yep. And we might talk once every two weeks, once every month, way less, once every six months. And then, hey, I'm driving through your area of the country. And then you stay with them for three days. Yep. And it's like, things never change. Yep. You know? And yeah, it's just like opening up and forming a close relationship is always worth it because you never know where that's going to lead when you might resume that relationship yeah. you know yeah. it's just i hope this is making sense and i, I think like, it's it's not transactional i think it's okay right yeah that there are some people in our life that are seasonal they're just going to come and go they come in for a time yeah. and and or they don't and that's fine but i also think yeah uh, we don't do the same with friendships as we do with other relationships where you're kind of you're kind of stuck with your family i always say like can't really do much more about that. They're they're there, right? Yeah, they're and just there. When you ask someone to date or, or marry, like you ask them that question. What's that? Like, will you marry me? Oh, right? There, marry there's me. there's commitment. Yes. But with our friends, because we only have one word for friend in the English language, and I think a lot of people are buddies and pals or yeah, drinking acquaintances. Friends. They're not they're not friends. friends. They don't like, know you. Being friends with Boris. Being friends with Boris is the title of this video. <laughs> Demand something of me. Oh, you said that the other day. And I think we don't like covenant, commitment, right? We never say to our friends, hey, I think we have a really special friendship here. Can we can we deepen this or let's let's commit to this? Like be intentional. Be intentional. Right? That it's not just eh, if I see you, I see you. If I don't, I don't. Like don't be afraid to ask for what you need. Right. From people. And if they don't give that to you, they're not the people for you. Correct. They're just not. Most people are not. You know, most people are not. And that's fine. Right. But when you do find those, like, because we can only really have five to ten yep. really, really close relationships. Otherwise, we just won't have time for anything else. Right. You know? But, like, if you find one of those people, that is the most valuable thing you'll ever find. Mm -hmm. So, like, give it a chance. Right. You know? And you never know. Like, maybe somebody you meet now. And then it's like, well, we just didn't vibe, or things didn't mesh, or they were in whatever situation. And then six months later, you right. run into each other again. But then you have something to build off if they're not a stranger anymore. Right. So just give it a chance, man. 
and, you know what I mean? And be willing, if you can, to, right? I mean, with Zoom and FaceTime, like we right. can do things that we couldn't do before. Right. So if, if I move away or Boris moves away, well, Syracuse ends convenience, not connection. Ends convenience, not connection. Right. Being in the same city and like splitting means you, it's not as convenient anymore, but you still have the connection. Right. That's not going anywhere. Correct. And like, I mean, so Tom used to do this at a, at a college, and of course what happens in college, everybody moves away. Everyone, you know, Jake joined the military and is now, who knows where, Oklahoma, I think. Minnesota, uh, North Dakota. One of those whatever yeah. states, uh, no offense. Uh, and so he's far away, but sure enough, you know, Tom sees him at least once a year, a couple yeah. times a year. Yeah. Uh, other people move away, Tom like goes on road trips and sees them and like they get together. Yeah. Those connections are there. Convenience, yeah, it's less convenient. Connection is still always there. Yeah. Always. I remember uh, after graduation, and Jake had to report like right after graduation. Yeah, yeah, um, he did. They didn't take very many people because they were backlogged from COVID, but they wanted him right away. Yeah. And so we were saying goodbye, and he goes, Well, thanks for everything. And I remember Is this it was a defense mechanism. But I remember oh. saying, I said, Are you? What are you writing me off? Yeah, I said right. the last time I checked, I said this was the this was the season finale, not the series finale. Oh, I like that. But it, the, this is a season, not not a yeah. The transitions that we have to go through. I often think about this on move-in day on college campus, and I don't know oh, what yeah. it's going to be like for my own daughter when I have to like take her. But uh -huh. if an alien landed on Earth and watched us drop our kids off on the first day of college. Yeah. They must think they're never going to see them again. Right. It's like the ending of ET, right? Like, yeah. You know, like, like they're just. When in reality, they're probably going to go home the next weekend for Labor probably. Day or family weekend. But there's something that we have to. I always I tell yeah. people we have to love each other through the transition, you know. Because the reality is, two days after graduation, as Jake's driving across the country, mm -hmm. he called me. Yeah, right. <laughs> so still connected. Right. But it's the right. ending of that chapter. And and we don't. We do all these things to onboard people mm -hmm. to a new job to right. college. Like they spend a week in orientation, but we do a very Poor job when people leave take. What do you mean? We don't we don't do that well. We like, don't do an offboarding. Yeah, like the like the senior class they need to go through certain milestones. Mm -hmm. Graduation is that's what it's meant to be mm -hmm. academically. But what about the socialization? It's crazy. They mean? they graduate. They have then they have to be off campus by like six o'clock that night. Oh, that day. Families yeah. are here. You're trying to take pictures. The parents are like, we want to get you moved out and get on the road. And the student who's been in this whole environment is suddenly just yanked from it yeah. without any kind of closing ritual. No closure. Right. Yeah. Of those friend groups of this, like, you are living a memory. Mm -hmm. like, right now we are living a memory. Yeah. Right? To have, like, let's, be in, let's get this group out to dinner and reflect on these four years we've had together. Because this... Won't happen like this again. It's not that other things won't happen. Right. Weddings, graduate, right? Sure. But this, just the eight of us, or just the four of us. Yeah. You need to you need to take time. Yeah. To do that. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, and I see it happen all the time. I had one student, and they they had a great graduation day, very happy, upbeat, happy, right? They were fun. And they were driving home to Long Island, and they pulled in their driveway, mm -hmm. and they started crying. Yeah. And they told me, they said, Tommy, I didn't even see that coming. Oh, yeah. Like, that's what it took for me to realize it's over. College is over. Yeah. Because they just didn't give themselves that. But I think we just have to do that. You know? Well, and they were busy going on to the next, on to the next, yep. senior week, this event, that event, this event, that event. They weren't, they didn't actually sit there with somebody else and think, like, well, not just what's next, but, like, this is, this is my last week in college. Yes. Things are changing. Yep. How does that feel? Right. What do you think? What does that mean to you? What does that mean to me? Maybe it means the same thing. It's like, I just feel like if we took time to do that. And to know that you can have multiple emotions at once. Yeah. Yes, you're going on to this exciting thing. Yeah, you're you're going on to grad school. Yeah. But leaving this behind is a very sad. Is, is sad. Very sad, right? Yeah. So like like we talked about like let's let's deal with this. Mm -hmm. Grad school is in two months. Like let's feel these feelings. Because the feelings are there as a barometer. Right? I think if the weatherman didn't pay attention to the barometer, it doesn't. We would 
right? A tornado's coming, oh, don't worry about it. No, oh, pay attention, yeah. right? Yeah. The feelings are there. They're feedback. Right, it's yeah. all feedback. Yeah. Why am I anxious about this? Why am I peace about this? Like, mm -hmm. to feel that, to be able to ask, mm -hmm. why am I feeling like this? Or yeah. I don't know where this is coming from. Or, yeah. like, I struggled with depression. And I could go through the list, right? I have good friends, a great major school, good family. I can give you all the reasons why I shouldn't be depressed. Be depressed. Yeah, yeah. but I the am. The reality was I was. I am. And I needed help. Right. And thankfully, I had people that got me help. Right. Because I was trying to rationalize it like, I shouldn't feel this way. Mm -hmm. But I did. You were know, trying to make a transactional. Right. You're trying to be like, well, if I have X, Y, Z, and whatever, I should not feel bad. Right. And that's just dumb. But right. We all know as human beings that's not how it works. It's like in Fight Club. He's like, I had a whole apartment and my wardrobe was almost complete. Why am I feeling like something is missing? Oh, I need to burn it all down and live in a house with no bathroom. And then, you know, he was more satisfied even though he was schizophrenic. Different story. The point is, the point is, your feelings are feedback. Yes. They're objective. They mean, like... The feeling itself is objective. Like, I'm angry. It's like in my stomach. Like, I feel like I just something's going to come out. I'm angry. Or I'm sad. Like, my chest feels heavy. And just, oh, I just want to, like, sink into this chair and disappear. Those are, that's objective. That's how you feel. What does it mean? Is something you need to sit in a room, preferably with somebody who really knows you, like Tom, mm -hmm. or by yourself with a journal yeah. and figure it out. And be what careful is going on. When, when emotions portray as one thing, but they're mm -hmm. actually something else. How so? A lot of times, anger will present itself, but you're not really angry, you're hurt. Okay. Um, okay. But the reaction sometimes is anger. Like I'm right? disappointed, I can't, yeah, but I'm I can't really believe angry. they said this, or I'm so mad at them because they did this. Mm -hmm. When you reflect on that, mm -hmm. it's because you, you're hurt. By their action, or by, but sometimes sometimes anger presents itself as anger, like righteous indignation, mm -hmm. when it's not that. Like you shouldn't be doing that. Like what does that mean? Why 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 do you think I shouldn't be doing that? But no one's gonna say it's because it makes me feel insecure. It makes me feel like you're gonna leave. It makes me feel you know bad about myself. And this why it's just like no, I think you shouldn't be doing that. I think that's what you mean by the righteous indignation. Yes. Like. Oh man, that's a big thing. Is like us trying to control others in our lives or outside of our lives. It's definitely like there's four fingers pointing back. You know, you do this. There's one, yep, one, two, three pointing back. You point, and there's one, two, three pointing back because it always means something about you. Correct. You know, I, I think the righteous indignation one's a big one. Yep. Like, how dare you do that? Well, what do you mean? Why can't I live my life this way? Well, because it makes me feel insecure. You know, yep. or I don't like you chasing your dreams because I feel like I'm not chasing mine. Right. Just a couple of common examples. <laughs> but that's a big one. Trying to control others because of how you feel inside. Yep. That's a big one. Yep. I think a lot of people, it's been my experience, will feel two ways. You can substitute the word, but two ways when they mm -hmm. interact with others. Mm -hmm. Inspired mm -hmm. or intimidated. Inspired or intimidated. And that's not on you. Right? The fact that when I hang out with Boris, I'm inspired. Mm -hmm. But Boris is not sitting here setting up to inspire Tom. No, I'm not. He's just being him. We're just hanging out. Right? Or if I hang out with somebody else and I'm like, man, I'm really intimidated by them. That's not on them. Mm -hmm. Right? They're living their best life, not shrinking from who they are. Right. Living life to their best abilities. Mm -hmm. So why am I intimidated? That means more about you. But me. Yeah. Unless they're like consciously trying to. Correct. You know? Correct. But I just mean everyday interactions with people. Man, I really, boy, they really inspired me. Mm -hmm. Or, or man, I just, I feel like I'm not enough when I'm with them. Mm -hmm. Well, why? But that's not on them. But, right, that's if it's not you. coming from them, it's on me. Exactly. And, like, most people would avoid that interaction. You know? Right. Most people would avoid that. Like, if I'm hanging out with someone who's, I don't know, objectively better in nine different ways, right. you know, I probably would feel intimidated. You know, and I probably would avoid spending a lot of time with that person. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But that's on me. Mm -hmm. You know, not on them. And I, I see that so often on teams or in the church circles, or you know, man, I'm I'm not I'm not as devoted as them, or I'm not as faith filled as them. Right. Like, I can't lift as much weight as they can. Like, but 
But they're not asking you to. Right. Right? Right. They're just on their own journey. Right. Which is totally different from yours. But you can do it together. Right. You know? And Mother Teresa has a quote that I love because so often we think that well in order to be friends with somebody like they want me to be like them like, and she would always say when people would say I wish I could be like you mm-hmm. Mother Teresa said you can't be like me right. and I can't be like you right. but together mm-hmm. we can do something beautiful for God mm-hmm. and that's the gift that's the gift of this right? that I have certain skills you have certain skills right. like one of the things I love about Boris is he will just cut right to the chase yeah. you know, some people I'm, hate that all right, right. <laughs> he's very direct very um, like to a fault literally to a fault and I, which is, I'm working on it. True story, right? When I when I was diagnosed, I didn't tell Boris. And I kind of evaded him. Why? Because he's a PA. Mm. So I knew that he knew what cancer was. And I hadn't even Googled what oh, I had yeah. yet. And nor had I said out loud oh. that those three words, I have cancer. Mm-hmm. So we were supposed to have breakfast. Oh, I remember that. And this. I kept putting them off and finding them like, all right, like, we'll have breakfast. There's been a lot going on. And I took a shower, and I got out, and I passed out. Oh, I didn't even know that happened. From a panic attack. That same morning? Oh, yes. from the pan- Yeah, he told me that. Because I didn't want to tell him, mm-hmm. because I know that Boris can be very direct. Mm. Yeah. Right? It was, it was me. I was being, it was, and so finally I was like, okay, you can't go out. You're not ready to be out of the house. Mm-hmm. So I have him over. Oh, yeah, instead of going to breakfast, he invited me over to the house. Right. Because I thought he was ghosting me. Correct. Because Tom, he doesn't always respond. He's busy. But, like, if you have plans, he's never missed plans with me. Right. And that morning, I hadn't even heard from him. I was like, what the heck? Like, we literally have plans. Yep. You know? Yep. And then he's like, hey, come over to the house and set up the restaurant. Right. Yeah. And so so I, I told him, right? And I, and I can sometimes shy away from being direct with people because I don't want to upset them. Mm-hmm. And, and you're not trying to upset but, but, again, use that, right? Use that gift. Like I know, if I'm struggling with something and I tell you, mm-hmm. you're gonna, you're not, you're not diddle fritzing around. You're gonna be like, I'll tell you exactly what I think. <laughs> exactly what you think. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm working on it. But, like, <laughs> but, but, but without sugarcoating it, like I, I have that capacity right. to tell you exactly what it is. Yes, yes, and, and a lot of people won't. No, and you know? some sometimes I need that. People need right. that. Other times they need. Sometimes you don't. A more soft and sometimes you don't That's at all. Coming, right, but and the, uh, but you need mom and dad. Yes. Yeah. But use yeah. both gifts. Yes. You know? Yeah, let's build your team. But anyway, so that morning, yeah. you so know, he's like, come over to the house. Yep. And so I told him, you know, I was like, I have cancer. And he's like, whoa. Right? He didn't give me the whole, what I had, the narrative that I had played in my head. What did you think I was going to say? Dude, that sucks. You're going to die. You thought I was going to say that? Yeah. Because you know this, you know oh the reality of life. God. Why would I say that to a human being? <laughs> right, right. I would never say that to somebody. But but we climbed that ladder of inference. Oh, so this so was pretty early on. You didn't know me that well. I, I knew you well enough. Decently but this well. was. But this you was thought that I would say years. something like that. Yeah. yeah. Because and I knew that you weren't wrong. Right. I didn't want to hear. But that. you didn't know that I would not say something like that to a person. Correct. Right. Correct. Mm-hmm. I think you know. So often we climb the ladder of inference. Where let's say I, uh, right? We've all done this. I I text Boris, and I don't hear from him. Right. And throughout the day, I think, oh my gosh, like, did I did I do something? Is he? He yeah, must he be hasn't mad answered at him. all day. He and I start, had... then I go back to our last interaction. I'm like, well, I don't I don't think I pissed him off. Right, right, right. right. But man, maybe I said this and he took it the wrong way. Yeah. And like throughout the day, it just keeps getting. And then, well, what if what if he got in a car accident? Or what if he? Mm. Oh my gosh, what if he's dead? Like, who's even gonna know? Right. Like, right. And in reality, I hear from you later, and they're like, "Yeah, sorry, I, I like lost my phone. It was a whole other deal. I had to like, drive back to Alex Bay where I left, picked it up." Yeah, like, I remember that. Like, oh, yeah. And then you feel <laughs> like, oh, of course, right? Then you right. Put it, you know. But to to ask the the clarifying question when you need to, mm-hmm. and don't climb that ladder, right? So in the shower, I had gone from I've got to tell Boris this thing, to he's going to tell me that sucks. You're going to die. And now I don't want to hear that, so I don't want to talk to him. Right. Yeah. Without, like, why can't you just go to breakfast like you always do with this mm-hmm. man? And why can't you talk about this the way you've talked about everything else? It's a big deal. Right. Yeah. But we've it's never shied deal. away from anything. But this is a big deal. Right? right. Yes. Yeah. But so is, so is divorce. But so this is, is a big deal. Divorce. Yeah. Yeah. 
But again, if it's human, and I believe it's, we can mention it, mm -hmm. we have got to do that in society. We have got to talk about things yes. that we are afraid to talk about. I don't understand why there's such what appears to be shame around miscarriage. My wife and I had one. Nobody talks about it. It's extremely common. And it's nobody extremely fault. common. So common. No one talks about it. And as soon as we said we, we miscarried, or, oh, I did that four times, or I had sick, right? 30%-ish, I think. Right. I'm pretty sure the statistic is around 30% of uh, pregnancies or miscarriages. Yeah. Extremely common. Talk no about one talks it. about it. You know? I asked a student, the, I asked another student one day, I, I started, first time I met them, I said, who are you? And their answer to me was, I'm an alcoholic. Whoa. That was what they led me. Whoa. They've been wanting to tell someone that for a while. Right. Yeah. You know, but have the courage to, to talk about it. Because when you, yeah. when you let it out, see, when I shared with you what it was, that was another step of not letting it control me. Yes. It was out there so now you could help me control it. Yes. I, I couldn't change it, but I could start to wrap my head around it. So we were sitting there at your dining room table right. that morning when you told me. And I honestly do not remember it much. I remember sitting there for a long time, but I don't remember the interaction. Well, and I did we just I, talk about it? We did. And I remember feeling like nothing has changed. Sadly, a lot of people with a cancer diagnosis lose their friends, lose a spouse, because those people are afraid. To watch a loved one suffer, it makes sense. They lose their friends and their spouse. People divorce people when they're diagnosed with cancer? Yes. Sometimes. Yep. Because the pain of, is too... Yep. Yeah. Um, and I've been, I have been very fortunate that that hasn't happened. Yeah, that nobody's like you, treating me differently. Closer. Yep. If anything, yeah. Yep. Um, but invite people into it. Yeah. You know? Um, because they... They know they can't change it. It's just like anything else. But a lot of times we think, well, I don't know what to say. Sure. I, I don't know what to do. Because <laughs> we're making it about us. Well, there's nothing to do. And they don't want anything. Yeah. They just want you to be there. Literally. That's it. Let's just talk it through. That's it. Or it's just sit in the rabbit hole with me. They just let me talk. And say, this sucks. Yep. Yep. Or just sit there. Yep. Literally. Or just sit there. Like, you don't have to say things. No. You don't have to fill the silence. Correct. We're recording this, so we have to fill the silence at least some of the time. But like when you're just sitting there with a friend, you don't have to say or do anything, literally anything. Yeah. I just had a friend go, I'm not gonna give him any details, but I just had a friend go through something hard and we were hanging out and I noticed a lot of the time we were just kind of sitting. But I'm sure that friend was happy that we were just sitting together instead of them sitting alone. Correct. We were just sitting there. Yeah. Like we talk here and there. And sometimes we get into something a little deeper, and sometimes it would just be surface level, like, yeah, this guy's really blue today. It's more blue than yesterday. Uh, it, but a lot of the time, it was just, we were just there. Yep. Just another heartbeat around. Yep. And like that's as important as talking, if not more. Yep. You, know, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to like deliver value or prove yourself by being there and like by saying something or by doing something or by cleaning their house or cooking or just being. Mm -hmm. Just you just being there is more important than all of that. Yep. Especially when someone's going through something. One of the things that happened at Lemoyne, another lesson I learned from a student, they came by and they were really hurting. And I remember this was years ago. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I said to them, Do you want me to call the wellness center or maybe we'll call a friend of yours? Because they were very depressed. They they were they'd gone through a breakup and they were sure. crying and really mm -hmm. upset. And and so I asked those questions and then they said that's why I came here. Mm. And that really floored me. Instead of the wellness center or right. a friend, they like, came to Tom. A ask yourself sometimes, why did they come to me? I had somebody mm. reach out to me a year ago, right around this time, mm -hmm. and they texted me and they said, are you free for breakfast tomorrow? Yeah. And my initial reaction, I was about, I was literally writing, no, right. I already have plans. Mm -hmm. And I, I stopped and I thought, this person, who could have breakfast with anybody is asking me if I'm free tomorrow. Hold on, right? So I I deleted it and I said, sure. How about 11 o'clock at Rustin's, which is a diner, right? Because I knew that I had already had eight o'clock plans with a friend at friendly hours. But that other person didn't need to know that. Sure. 
So I had my eggs at finally hours. And I had my bacon And then Rustin's. I had my pancakes, pumpkin pancakes, <laughs> at Rustin's at 11 o'clock. Tom's got a sweet tooth like no other. But neither person knew. The man knew, eats so many pancakes. Right? With but, all the syrup. <laughs> I know that about Tom. But uh, yeah. He's like a little donut holic. I, you know, you know. He loves his donuts. If you want to make this man happy, you get him donuts. But not any donuts. Green Hills donuts. Green Hills donuts. The best. The worst. And un- unchanged since I was a kid. <laughs> good. So good. <laughs> so good. So. Donuts. Yeah. Yes. And I interrupted. Well, I, right. So <laughs> Boris went on vacation. You were traveling somewhere. Are you talking about this person that you Donuts. Met? No, you. Donuts. Oh, oh and, we're still on donuts. Okay. And, and, and he wrote, he said, I got something for you. Right, and wow. so we yeah. get together for breakfast, and he he got me a pair of donut socks. Yep. Right. Yeah. That, though, those are the things. Like that's what life is about. You know, donut little, socks. Little no, just little tiny donuts or socks or donut socks. That, right. That you you saw something. It's like you paid attention. Yes. To my life. Yes. You were astonished. You don't agree with it. Yes. But you did something about it. Yes. Right? And so I, now I know forever, mm-hmm. I have so many socks. I know who gave me this pair. <laughs> right? And I know it, it, it's it's comical. I think we wore them together. Yes. That was Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, okay, yes. If, if I can find that photo, I'm going to post it. There's a picture of me and Tom in our matching donut socks. Just like, you know, holding our photo up so you can see like that they're matching. Yep. Yeah. Or maybe mine had coffee and yours had donuts. I don't remember. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, we did that. Yep. And being able to point out the humor, right? So as he's teasing me about donuts, you had a picture up on Instagram not that long after. I had out eating french fries. Sure did. And I'm like, aren't these just fried potatoes? And here I'm eating fried yeast. What's the difference? <laughs> it's the same thing. So. I'm not going into my spiel about donuts. That's funny. I just think it's a problem. Yeah. I don't know. That beca- oh, that, okay. I'm not going to go into this. It was a whole thing. It was a whole thing at work. It was a whole thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, because my last job, I worked at a primary care office that also specialized in weight loss medicine. Like, we'd be putting people on medications to help them eat less so that they can, you know, lose weight and their metabolic symptoms would, you know, start to go away, all their, like, diabetes, cholesterol, all that stuff. And this lady that we had been treating for years with weight loss medications brought in donuts, and I lost it. I was like, Head just exploded. I was just done. Well, and, oh man, I was not happy that day. After I and that's when I started hating donuts. <laughs> after, loves them. After I had my kidney, Green Hills. The, uh, the do- I said, what should I do with my diet? And the doctor said, just drink a lot of water, mm-hmm. limit protein, like don't go keto. Um, <laughs> and, uh, drink your water. And, um, and watch your salt intake. And I right. said to him, I said, can I still have cheese and carbs? And he said, yeah. So I'm like, I'm good. I'm good. Tom runs on carbs. Well, he's a talent. Yeah, Italians are a different breed. They like lose weight when they have pasta instead of gain weight. Like, I don't know. Italians are different. I don't get that. Yeah. Anyway, I should probably check my messages because I did promise to take someone to a motorcycle shop. Um, so, any closing remarks? No. Who are you? That's where we started. Right? That's where we started. Who are you? And oh. that whoever you are, mm-hmm. know that you can be a gift through who you are and not for what you do. At the end of every episode, I'll leave you with this, Fred Rogers always says, you've made this day a special day. Mm -hmm. And you know how? By just your being you. Mm -hmm. There's only one person in the whole world like you, and that's you yourself. Mm -hmm. And people can like you exactly as you are. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to like you. Doesn't mean they will. But they'll still appreciate it. But they can. Yeah. Thanks, boys. Good to be with you. Good to be with you as always. Until next time. Another Tom talk. Anyway, y'all. No, uh, what was I going to call this video? I had it. Oh, yeah. I think I'm going to call this video the loneliness problem. I'm going to call this video the loneliness problem. Because if you, like, listen back, and I hope that you will, Tom's whole, like, purpose in life that he discovered is listening to people, being that person that actually truly, like, listens and appreciates, which very few people do. Uh, so Tom's basically made a career slash hobby slash purpose out of it, just listening to people and appreciating them for who they are because he looked outside his window on campus and noticed everybody was walking alone. Yeah. Everybody was walking like with their heads and their phones or just looking up at the sky or at the ground 
and just alone. Everyone was just being alone. And that's our problem right now. That's our epidemic of loneliness because people aren't connecting. They're transacting, they're doing things sometimes, but they're not together. They're not connecting. And if you can ask somebody a question mm-hmm. out of care and concern, yeah. do it. So often we don't ask questions because we feel like we shouldn't be nosy. Mm-hmm. The person on the other end of that will usually receive it as well they care about me. If you ask it in the right time and place and in the right way, don't call them out in public or yes. text them, right? Like say, hey, I noticed such, are you really okay? Yeah. They can't believe that in this busy world that you would take the time to notice them. So all those people in your life, like risk the ask. Mm-hmm. Don't be afraid to risk the ask. And also, if you're going to ask, you better sit there and listen. Yeah. You know, don't like open this up and then just shut them down. Correct. They start talking and it's like, well, you asked. You can't just be here for 90 seconds. You know? And so, don't try to fix it. Yeah. Just hold it. Just, just, yeah. just hold it. I like that. And follow up. I think, I think that, the follow up. that's yes. the secret sauce. That's what it is. Right? Like mm-hmm. after I meet with somebody for the first time, mm-hmm. I will often send an email and I mean it because I, I think, well, they came in and trusted me with XYZ. Mm-hmm. I will often send an email that, like, thank you for allowing me the privilege mm-hmm. to be in your company, to hear some of your story. Right. Or do that a few days later. That goes a long way. People can't believe that you even remember that you talked to them. Yeah. In this transactional world, people can't believe that you actually meant something to them. Correct. Yeah. More than just a transaction. Yeah. Yeah. Go do that. Do that for someone today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Take out an hour of your day that you were going to spend know, watching a show, scrolling. Yeah. Go just talk to someone. Someone you know already, preferably. Just ask them, hey, who are you? And they'd be like, what are you talking about, dude? Be, be the difference that makes all the difference in somebody's life today. Yeah. Go we'll do that. Until next time. Good episode. <laughs>